Can Ridley Scott conjure magic for the mob a second time? Gladiator 2 may be the sequel no one asked for, but we have a feeling it's gonna blow everyone away. Here's why. Good writing is the backbone of any movie. All too often, sequels are rushed into production to capitalize on the success of the first film. Obviously, this didn't happen with Gladiator, since it's been over two decades. But it's also clear that the decision to return to the world wasn't based solely on studio pressure and ticket sales. Ridley Scott has clearly invested a lot of time in making sure the script for Gladiator 2 is right where he wants it. In fact, he already scrapped another attempt to make the sequel four years before the current project because the story wasn't there yet. Scott explained this first attempt at Total Film, saying that the first writer, Peter Craig, was very good and a personal friend, but they couldn't get their heads around the right idea for a sequel, so after 10 months, they pulled the plug. Eventually, Scott and company gave it another go, and apparently found an angle that resonated. This time, they brought on David Scarpa, who has worked on multiple projects with Scott. David Franzoni, who helped write Gladiator, also has a writing credit on the film, as does Craig. A creative team that is willing to spend so much time wrestling with the script is a sign that we can expect a solid final product when this thing finally reaches the public. History buffs tend to have a love-hate opinion of Gladiator. It takes a lot of artistic license with the facts, but at the same time, it recreates fascinating historical locations on a scale few other films have. Gladiator starts in Germania, on the northeastern borders of the Roman Empire. We see Hispania for a few minutes before the narrative moves even further south to North Africa. Finally, the story moves to Rome, and it remains there till the end of the film. This has plenty of world-building already, but it also leaves the doors wide open for the sequel to expand, especially when you're talking about something as big as the Roman Empire. What do they care about Germania? They care about the greatness of Rome. At its height, that empire and its client states stretch north to south from modern Britain to the Sudan and east to west from Morocco to Azerbaijan. It was absolutely massive and contained countless different cultures, most of which didn't make it into the first movie. Based on promotional footage and interviews, we already know that we're going to return to North Africa and the province of Numidia. Historically, Emperor Caracalla and Macrinus also journeyed to the eastern limits of the empire, where they tangle with the Parthians, an empire roughly situated near modern Iran. Suffice it to say, there's a lot more of this massive Roman world to explore. And even using a fraction of the potential could make the Gladiator sequel feel ten times bigger than its predecessor. The historical parallels of Gladiator 2 have exciting potential, but there's another aspect to Ridley Scott's period piece that will likely amplify the enjoyment – the fictional element. Gladiator is rife with incidents and characters that bend the truth. That's not a criticism. Most of the historical inaccuracies in Gladiator make the movie better. Commodus dispatching his father with a hug, for instance, instantly positions him as pure villain. His own death in the arena is more epic than his historical fate. Heck, the invention of Maximus was a major reason for the movie's appeal. We could see similarly interesting historical fiction in Gladiator 2. For example, Senator Gracchus was invented for the first film and was clearly inspired by a number of famous Roman senators. Gracchus is returning for the sequel, and his position of power, especially after Maximus instructs him to restore the Roman Republic, could significantly impact the storyline. The fate of Rome. I leave to you. Macrinus is another interesting one. Denzel Washington's character appears to be named after the first equestrian, basically a member of the upper middle class to become emperor. Historically, that makes Macrinus an overachieving lawyer. In the Gladiator 2 trailer, Macrinus says he was once owned. If the line implies that he was a slave, that would be a rewrite clearly targeting a more dramatic and compelling rise to power. In other words, the world has plenty of documentaries about Rome. If inventing a few plot elements makes for a better story, Gladiator 2 will be all the better for it. Gladiator ends with the death of Commodus and hope for a return to the Roman Republic. By the time we pick up the story decades later in Gladiator 2, Rome is ruled not by one, but two emperors. This new royal blood takes the form of Caracalla, played by Fred Heckinger, and Geta, played by Joseph Quinn. These imperial leaders aren't the most famous emperors in Roman history, but they're remembered as decadent, spoiled brats with no inhibitions. There are victories yet still to come. In the historical narrative, they come to power early as co-rulers. Within a year of the death of their father, Septimius Severus, Caracalla strangles his brother right in the arms of their mother. Caracalla rules solo for a while, until he's assassinated by a rogue officer while sending to nature's cool on the side of the road. The leader of the coup is none other than a fellow named Macrinus. 
The historical aspect of the Geta and Karkala reign is dramatic enough, but if you toss them into a story that, based on Gladiator, will loosely follow the historical narrative at best, chances are these siblings will stoop to the lowest levels of horror and depravity. Scott gave a hint of that when he explained, Karkala and Geta are twins and are definitely damaged goods from birth. Anyone can draw a political parallel with any movie if they try. Nevertheless, certain stories lend themselves to the practice more than others, and Gladiator 2 is definitely one of them. Ridley Scott has drawn direct attention to the connections between the cutthroat world of ancient Roman culture and politics and the atmosphere he sees currently. He told Vanity Fair, The leadership is in total chaos. We have demagogues. That's a good word. The people who are in charge are out of their minds, and everyone is too afraid to contradict. That's familiar ground right now. In the same interview, Paul Meskel also spoke to the political struggle in the film and the will not just to survive but to win, both in and out of the arena. He said, Where's the space for humanity? Where's the space for love, familial connection? And ultimately, will those things overcome this kind of greed and power? Those things are oftentimes directly in conflict with each other. The fight between power and the people, politics and humanity, these are themes that are likely to resonate with audiences as they head to theaters this November. Because this is what they believe in. Power. Both Lucius and his mother Lucilla are very loosely based on historical characters. Lucilla was indeed Commodus' sister, but in the real story, she is killed by her brother when he discovers her plotting against his life. One of her children is also named Lucius, but he doesn't appear to have lived past youth. That means when Gladiator 2 begins decades after Commodus' death, both characters will be firmly in historical fiction territory. The question is, where will their stories go next? As far as Connie Nielsen's character is concerned, the historical Lucilla remarried a Roman general. This could be the inspiration for Pedro Pascal's general, Acacius, who functions partly as a love interest for Nielsen's character. What her role is in a Roman world that has moved past the reigns of her father and brother, though, remains to be seen. When it comes to Paul Mescal's Lucius, that's where Scott is likely to have some real fun. Lucius is already historically altered in the sense that he probably died in childhood. This frees up Mescal's version of the character to be whatever Scott needs him to be, positioning him to carry on the mantle of the heroic but made of Maximus without any historical restrictions. The original Gladiator was almost perfectly cast. It featured both A-list actors and up-and-comers that included the likes of Richard Harris, Russell Crowe, Joaquin Phoenix, and Jaimon Honsu. And Gladiator 2 is just as full of talent. The film is packed with major actors who have well-established careers, including Pedro Pascal, Joseph Quinn from Stranger Things, and A Quiet Place Day One, and the legendary Denzel Washington. <laughs> At the center of it all is Paul Meskel as Lucius, the movie's protagonist and a character who was a child in the first film. Meskel is not widely known to mainstream audiences yet, with his highest profile roles coming in independent films like All of Us Strangers, After Sun, and The Lost Daughter, and the 2020 miniseries Normal People. In fact, it was the latter, a romantic drama set in a small town island, that got Meskel hand picked for the role in Gladiator 2. Ridley Scott told Vanity Fair, Watching a TV show that's not really my kind of TV show almost four years ago, I said, Who's this guy? I met with him and he said, Of course I'd love to do it. And that was it. We were away and running with the ball. He was a special find. He was absolutely perfect. One of the biggest things Gladiator 2 is going for it is that Ridley Scott is on board to direct. Whatever the overall final product may be, at least there's an industry veteran overseeing the production who has already left a trail of popular films in his wake. Gladiator 2 also marks the first time Scott has helmed a direct sequel in one of the multiple popular movie franchises he's created over his career. The 86-year-old director has been at the helm of numerous iconic franchises, including Alien and Blade Runner, as well as historical epics like Black Hawk Down, Kingdom of Heaven, and Napoleon. But he wasn't able to initially return for the sequels to Alien and Blade Runner, even if he did eventually find his way back to making more Alien movies. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Scott explained that he didn't love missing out on either of those sequels, saying, I should have done the sequels to Alien and to Blade Runner. You change over the years. At that time, I didn't want to go through it again. He added that his relative lack of leverage in 1980s Hollywood prevented him from returning to those fledging franchises. Now that he probably has as much leverage as anyone in Hollywood, he finally has the chance to help on the follow-up to one of his most famous films. You can bet or pour everything into making it perfect. Finally, say what you want about some of Scott's movies, but there's no denying that he makes films on a grand scale. Gladiator was filmed on immense sets with thousands of extras in a way that captured the grit and realism of the era, at least enough of it to immerse the audience in the action. Maybe it's an old-school way of thinking, but green screens and digital sets still haven't quite managed to create as immersive an experience as pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into intricately crafted full-size sets, where every spray of sand and bead of sweat speaks of reality. Scott may not capture his 
historical authenticity, but he does capture cinematic authenticity. Even though almost 25 years have passed between Gladiator and now, one thing that hasn't changed is Scott's approach to filmmaking. We haven't seen any behind-the-scenes glimpses into the filmmaking process for Gladiator 2 yet, but it's a good sign that many of the cast interviews hint at the same sheer scale of filmmaking Scott is known for. Because like this isn't going to happen again. Uh, for anyone. I mean, no one makes movies like that. No. It's a fair bet that Gladiator 2 will at least blow everyone away with spectacle alone. And as long as everything falls into place, it's guaranteed to be an enthralling experience.